Well, welcome to Walking Through Worlds and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the, the land and water that we're doing this recording today uh, in this place called Mianjin. Mm -hmm. And the traditional custodians being the Turubu and the Yagara people of this land. And I'm paying my respects to all elders, past, present, and all the Australian Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders of this country, the first owners and custodians of this land. And today I'm very excited about a very dear friend of mine who we're going to bring onto our podcast and introduce you all to. Um, I'd like to give you some background. I met uh, Auntie Betty McGrady, who's sitting right here. She's a proud Gungari woman. Um, she's very strong in culture and I've learned so much of, from her over the last, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Uh, when I first met her and I, I want a lot of you to hear uh, her wisdom. Today you're going to get this tiny little snippet into her life because she's not only done so many things, she's learned so many things, she can teach you so many things and I'm hoping today you get a, a, a snapshot of who she is, where she's come from. But rather than me talk about that, Aunty Betty McGrady, lovely to have you here. Tell us about who Aunty Betty is, where you're from, who is your mob? Thank you, Greg. I also want to acknowledge the, the people of this land and thank them for allowing us to be here today. I honour their customs, practices and traditions. And I'm thankful that they've been handed down through the generations. So our young people get to know what it's like, how important it is to be connected to the Aboriginal culture. It's the oldest living culture in the world and we need to draw strength from that. It's something that we have and something that they can't take away from us. So that's where I draw my strength, knowing that I'm connected to my Aboriginal culture. So having said that, I also want to acknowledge um, sorry business. Not only sorry business amongst families and communities, but as part of my heritage, my Afghani heritage, I also want to offer condolences to those people in Afghanistan who are currently suffering through no fault of their own. And I'm thankful that some of them have been brought out of the country and so they can have a, a new start in life. So I also want to acknowledge those people. Um, today... Can you just even backtrack? Sorry, business. To some people probably listen to this podcast... They wouldn't even know. They've heard of sorry, you know, they think of Kevin Rudd, you know, in that period in 2008. But explain to people what sorry business is. Well, sorry business is a period of time where someone's either suffering, has an illness, or someone has left us and passed away. We have to acknowledge their lives, their presence, and their families, and pay respect by acknowledging sorry business, to let them know that we haven't forgotten them, but we remember them in good light. Mm. Very good. So that's a word that is used quite commonly through First Nations, you know, sorry business, but it's not, it's not out in the broader white world, you know. Now, you also mentioned that you got Afghan. Yes, Afghani in, heritage, yeah. yeah. My grandfather came here with the camels way back in the late 1800s and married my Aboriginal grandmother. And uh, they knew at that time it was illegal for Aboriginals to, uh, what's the word, live with, inhabit mm. with anybody but Aboriginal people. And the union was illegal. And by the time the authorities caught up with them, there were six children in the family. and the authorities removed the whole six children. And um, it's painful mm. to think that um, my mother never got to see her mother again. Mm, mm, mm. Um, it's something that, it was very painful for my mother. It's something she never spoke about. I questioned, I had conversations with her and she said, oh, that's got nothing to do with you, you, you know. It's not your business. And she carried it herself. Um, so that she was of a family of six, and what about yourself? How many <coughs> how many siblings are you? Part seven of? siblings. I've all together. There's eight in the family. Yep. Three brothers and four sisters. 
Um, today there's probably four of us left. Uh, I'm the oldest one surviving. So three previous to me, elder than me, have passed on and one younger. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that I don't often think about when I'm talking to people, but it's always in the back of your mind, you know, when you're um, reminded by um, families that this used to happen, and I remember that, and I remember this, so, yeah. But... And where is your family from? Like, I said Gulgari, but exactly what... Oh. Where is that? A little place called Mitchell, about an hour's drive the other side of Roma. Most people know Roma, yep. Charleville, but not a lot know Mitchell. However, it's becoming more... Uh, predominant now because of the her, the thermal spa, the baths. Mm -hmm. A lot of people love to, to soak in that water because it does have healing qualities apparently. It's the sulphur in the water that you know makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. uh, it is. It's a, it's a temperature that's maintained all year round. Yep. You, know, you don't have to heat it. It's just pumped in. Yeah. And so you were raised there and, and did you do your school in there? I was raised on the banks of the Maranoa River. We lived in a mission. Well, actually, it wasn't a mission, it was a reserve because it was controlled by the native police. And my grandfather was the native police officer. No, sorry, my uncle, my, my dad's eldest brother, he was the native police officer that, mm -hmm. that was responsible for maintaining law and order there. But, I mean, we were family, so there wasn't much law and order <laughs> happening. <laughs> um, yeah, I grew up on the river banks. Um, Spent most of my time in the river. Loved it. If I couldn't be swimming, I was fishing or just roaming up and down, you know, looking for things to do. It was that mm -hmm. was my life. I loved it. Um, I used to wag school. Spend time in the river. <laughs> and every time my mother was looking for me, <laughs> I'd be down the river, you know. And my sister used to get really angry with me because every time it was my turn to wash up or my turn to do something, <laughs> I'd be down the river. <laughs> It's your turn to light the fire. Get up here. <laughs> your sanctuary. Your yeah. sanctuary. Yeah. Love the river. Yep. And what made you come to south, to Brisbane, to Mianjin? Um, well, I attended school. Didn't like it. I went into high school in year eight. And... Um, I don't know what it was, I just didn't like it. Um, I was halfway through, through year nine and my mother just got tired of, you know. <laughs> she said, and plus the fact that most of my friends, my teenage friends at that time were, you know, getting pregnant and having babies. And she said, it's not gonna happen to you. So she put me on the train and sent me to Brisbane to my eldest sister, Daphne. Daphne's no longer with us. Mm. And so how old were you then? Sixteen. Sixteen. And oh I, my goodness. <laughs> and I was sharing stories with the young girl here about the, the old metal Grey Street Bridge and how I used to run across there at night time because I was frightened of the dark. <laughs> Mom. So what year was this that you arrived in Brisbane? 66. 1966. 1966. So that's um, a year before the referendum. Yes. I had no idea when, when the referendum came around, I had no idea what it was, mm -hmm. what it was about. Yep. Um, I was in Brisbane um, living with my sister Daphne. We, uh, where did we live? Oh, we lived with Auntie, Auntie Maud, my mum's sister in um, Windsor. Yep. And then because she had other girls there, it was very cramped, so we, Daphne and I took a unit over at, a um, well, room it was, at um, Grey Street. Oh, West End, <laughs> South, yeah. yeah, where South Bank is. We lived there for a time and then we, we moved into another unit, oh, a house actually. A couple of cousins came down from Mitchell and there was about three or four, maybe five of us that, that actually lived in the house and um, Chermside, just behind Torbreak wow. there. Wow, wow. So, you know, it was, and it was really great because we had another few cousins a couple of blocks away who moved into a rooms and stuff <laughs> like that. So it was exciting times because we all used to get together and go, Ice skating. Oh. Ice skating was the was the deal at that time, and it was. Um, I did work. I worked at a um, 
My sister Daphne was working at a fruit shop in George Street and I took a job as a kitchen hand uh, in a, I think it was an Italian restaurant. It lasted two days. <laughs> hated it, probably Oh hated my it. goodness. But then I was lucky enough to find some work at Thomas Dixon Shoes around the corner from Gray Street. Mm -hmm. They had a big factory there and I was there for a few years, actually. Oh, two or three years, anyway. Um, and then something happened and I, oh, I was earning $10 a week and it was $9 for rent. <laughs> so I had nothing Whoa. to live on. And I said, no, nah, I might as well go back to living off the land. So I went back home. I went back home. And then Daphne got married in 68. I came back for her wedding and I stayed and met my husband, John McGrady, married in 69 and um, stayed around Thornside, Wellington Point for three or four years after I married and then I went back home to Mitchell. The marriage was sort of falling apart so I went back home. He followed me and we reunited and yeah. And 74, in between that he took jobs on the railways and we moved around a bit. In 75 I came back to Brisbane on my own with my children and um, stayed with mum and dad and just existed I suppose. I put the kids through school. Um, that was my life. Um, 81 I moved out to Logan with the kids. I just thought, well, you know, the house we were in was inappropriate, too small, cramped. And on the weekends I'd have my sister's kids there, so, you know, every now and, well, every weekend it was one sister or the other that dropping kids off. <laughs> because I had seven kids, I couldn't go anywhere. Oh my goodness, <laughs> so, wow. So, yeah, look, the kids loved it. Yes. Having all the mob there together and, you know, we used to go to the swimming pool, church first. <laughs> And family is such a big thing, isn't it, with yeah. First Nations? And Can I just explain about the, the thing? My mother was raised in a Church of England hostel, and um, religion was beaten into her. Mm -hmm. And then when we were growing up on the reserve, she made it a thing for us. You know, I don't know whether it was the beliefs that got to her or whatever, but she encouraged us to go to Sunday school. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when I was married and lived in South Brisbane now, I encourage my children to go to Sunday school mm. because it was a, a form of fellowship for the kids, you know, yes. where they could make friends and whatever and get out of my way for a little few hours. <laughs> but then Sunday afternoon, they go Sunday morning they'd go to church, they'd come home and have dinner and then they'd either go to the swimming pool or spend some time down the park. But it was good, it was a good atmosphere for the kids. Um, and then, like I said, the place was crowded there at West End, so I moved over to Logan. I stayed there since 1981. I've lived in Logan. And I've seen a lot of changes out there. So so you come into a place like Logan, and within Logan itself, it's a hot spot for um, new arrivals, isn't it? For oh, new migrants. And, yeah, absolutely. You know, you've got the Vietnamese moving in, and you've, you've got a lot of different cultures. The Italians probably still, and, you know. So now, how has that affected you today, like when you look at that period, which is like 50 years ago, that you moved to Logan, look, because I, one of the, the points that I, that I bring up is that you're so active in community. Yeah. So it be, you became so aware of the differences of people and you've always tried to bring your um, knowledge to them and educate them. And interesting that you're also navigating being Aboriginal, Afghan, Australian, the three A's. <laughs> <laughs> the triple A's, there you go. <laughs> I you never know, thought of it like that before. No, but either. you're walking in three worlds there and yeah. navigating that, you know, and I'm sure at that time yeah. you were navigating and having to deal with probably deep racism as well. Or were you exposed to that? Was that something um, you had to live with? Not so much uh, in like post 70s, I suppose. Um, prior to that, when I first came to Brisbane, yes, I was excluded from different venues and, you know, cafes and things because mm. I was Aboriginal. They just refused to serve you. Yep. And, and you accepted it, you, you know. You, you basically felt that you had no right to disagree. Mm. And, yeah, so. But later on, 
um, after the 70s, there were a lot of Aboriginal organisations established. Ah, that's yeah, right. So yes. We had the legal services, we had the health services, and we had the kindergartens and things like that. Mm. I became active in one of the kindergartens, Yalangi, because my children used to attend there. I was on the committee there, you know, just because they wanted to make up numbers, basically. I knew <laughs> nothing about kindergartens. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a learning curve for me. Yes. Um, and then I moved to Logan, and the, the reason... Um, I empathise with those people who come from war torn countries, you know. They're probably worse off than we are. Um, as Aboriginal people we can go certain places, but we still face the racism. And I can understand, I was listening to that thing that um, Mark Fennell's actually doing on ABC, mm -hmm. the racism thing. Um, and I'm going to watch it and they reckon it's a tearjerker because this happened to me. This mm. is exactly what happened to me. What happened? What is, what is happening in the schools now? This happened to me, um, and it's a way of educating, of course. Yeah. Uh, but you can only educate those that want to learn. Mm. There's there's people that don't want to learn, that don't want to listen, and therefore it becomes um, what do you call it? A, a it's like something you've got to persist at. I'm not going to let you go because I need, I want to teach you. And, and that's my reason for getting involved in all those other organisations. Like so what organisations are you involved in? I'm Vice President of the Queensland Multicultural Council, where all those Fabulous. ethnic groups are. Fabulous. I'm a peace ambassador. Yes. So <laughs> oh. I became a peace ambassador. So today is the International Day of Peace. Mm -hmm. So congratulations and so sending that, peace to everyone today. Yes, and again, that's that's about sharing, you know, and caring. Because uh, if I didn't care about you, then I wouldn't share. Mm. But it, it's not like you know, it's not like I don't care about anybody. I'll talk to anybody in the street. Yeah. And, and you know, people who know me say you need to stop that. You're doing too much. Yeah. But that wouldn't be me if I said no to somebody. You know, I, I struggle with that concept of saying no. Yes. Because if I say no to someone on the street who really needs help, then that could be the straw that breaks the camel's back for them. Yes. And I don't want to have that on my conscience. So, you know, I know it's, I know I'm internalising a lot of stuff, but it makes me feel good about myself, and that's why I do those things. You're very passionate in the community, apart from obviously with the Queensland Multicultural um, Association. Is it? Council. Council. Sorry. And you also work a lot around youth justice too. That's a big passion for you, oh, isn't it? Yep. When I started work, I was working with the Aboriginal Legal Service and it was purely because I was living on a pension and couldn't support my kids on that. We were living from hand to mouth on you know, the parent, single parent's pension. So I decided that I was gonna get a job and my mother came and looked after the kids while I qualified as a legal stenographer. First one at the Aboriginal Legal Service. A lot of firsts for me. Mm, mm. Um, I stayed, actually I, I started with Paul Richards mm -hmm. for 12 months. Wow. Paul gave me my first job yep. as a legal steno. And then I moved into the Aboriginal Legal Service where I stayed for three years. And because of the uncertainty around funding, way back in the uh, early 80s, um, I put in for a job at Department of Defence and I moved into the Finance Department of, um, Department of Defence. I stayed there for 17 years. Is because that right? Because wow. I had kids I needed to put through school. I yeah. had kids that I had to provide for. Yes. Um, and then the last two years I spent with Department of Veterans Affairs because um, the compensation, like compensation section, military compensation scheme was it didn't have a lot of clients. Mm. Veterans Affairs had more clients, so Veterans Affairs bought out the military compensation scheme. So that's when I transferred over to Veterans Affairs. And I, I stayed there for two years, I just didn't, that wasn't my... And then did you move into health? Was that... Yes. Yep. I um, went back to community actually after I left the Department of Defence. And I, with a couple of my sister Peggy, uh, Buster, Kathy and her partner Brian Rainbow, we established Nupture. Mm. 2002 
and NUTCHA first of all did, uh, was funded to provide women's uh, programs and then in 2006 we actually applied for the triennial funding for child protection. So we became a recognised entity in 2006 and we provided those child safety services to community for three years in 2009. Then the government decided that they were going to change the funding stream and if you weren't aligned with a health service, Aboriginal Health Service, then you weren't eligible for funding. And we, we just didn't think that that was the right mix. We mm. partnered with Red Cross and yep. they rejected our, our application. So 2009 then we, we sort of let everything go. We were in the doldrums till just recently, 2019. So wow. nearly 10 years. Gee. We were sort of, you know, that's when I went into Queensland Health. I was a drug and alcohol counsellor. <laughs> I was a cultural practice program facilitator. Mm. <laughs> just about. And then actually I stayed there for four years. And then I went into the Brisbane Youth Detention Centre. And I stayed in the Brisbane Youth Detention Centre for two years with children's health. I was a child and youth mental health worker. So what's the statistics of youth under 17 or under 18 in, in our... When I was in there? Detention centres, yeah. I left in 2018, so three years ago, it was 70, 80% Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. Really? 80%? 80%. Whoa. And I don't think most people hear that. No. I mean, I used to hear 50% and yeah. you still have a heart attack when you think that... When you get to work in there, I mean, and the, the issue is that our young fellows don't want to identify. So they're struggling with culture to start with? They're not connecting well, to Well, you know, when they come in and, and if they're fair-skinned, are you Aboriginal? Even though they are, they'll say no. So the statistics were based on that box that they were ticking or not ticking. But when you get to work in the system, when you're working with those people, you realise the true picture of the numbers. Yeah. Um, two years I lasted there. And I had an issue with a psychologist who said that I was, wasn't working with the young children the way that she believed I should be working with them. I mean, I'm working with these kids to create their Aboriginal identity, to give them strength and whatever, but it didn't fit with her her framework of psychology. So um, I had an argument with her and left. And, you know, it's no good, no good knocking on that door if it's not going to open, so I left. I left in 2018 and then I went back to community. I don't know where I went. I can't remember. <laughs> but I want to share something with you. Um, when I was with the Department of Defence, they actually sponsored me to study, and I studied at Griffith Uni. I wanted to do commerce, and mm -hmm. it didn't work out. And my partner at that time, Santa, he got sick, so I deferred my studies. Um, in 19, was it? No, 2000, after I'd finished the, the, with the Department of Defence, that's right, I, um, in 2003, 2004, that's when I was studying at Macquarie University. Someone encouraged me to, yeah, they, they got this new thing down there in Sydney. It's not offered here in Brisbane, but you know, they, you get, they fly you down there, they put you up in a hotel. <laughs> and you <laughs> did it. sound exciting. Yeah. For three years, Yep. I graduated in 2004 with my advanced diploma in community management because at that time in Macquarie, they didn't have the university degree. So from 2002, I think it was, 2007. That's five years. Mm. I finally got my university degree. You graduated? In 2007. Yes. At the ripe old age of 57. Oh, that's beautiful. So, so you're never I'm the too first, old. I am the first sibling. Yes. Although I've got nieces or nephews who have graduated from university prior to my... And then my sister Peggy, who's two years younger than me, did the same thing. <laughs> two years later. So you broke that sort of glass ceiling, that belief that you couldn't do it. Yes, yeah. my personal glass ceiling, but it was pos impossible to do it in government departments. I tried to break that glass ceiling. I was in defence for a long time and for, for many years I tried to um, upgrade, you know, the career pathway I wanted to. Kept on trying for an AO4, kept on trying. <laughs> mm. It wasn't happening. And then I met a 
a new manager came on board and he came from the Northern Territory, who was a white fellow who lived in the Northern, Alan Phillips was his name. We became real friends and he was on the panel and that's what got me the AO4. So, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing and sometimes disgusting that people who are sitting on your panels and because they're racist don't look at your capabilities and look at the colour of your skin. So, so what, yeah. what, what do you think it means to be Australian? Like, you know, you're working around new migrants coming in and then there's the old migrants like my sixth generation sort of convict connection and then there's First Nations. And you, you do like bringing them together to learn about, you know, yep. our ancient history so that they get a perspective of what's gone on. But, you know, when we say, what is an Australian? How would you, in your view, explain that? What is Australian? I don't identify as Australian. No. I identify as an Aboriginal person, so yep. that's my focus. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm an Australian living in, Aust I'm sorry, I'm an Aboriginal living in Aboriginal land. Yes. That's all that's important to me. Yes. Who I talk to, who I mix with, who I work with is a side issue. I do my best to get on with those people. Yep. I do my best to share my knowledge about my culture. I do my best to, you know, encourage them to learn. And that's what I talk about when I go and do these acknowledgements at these citizenship ceremonies. That it's about sharing our knowledge so we can get on, we, we can live together. And, um, you know, we, we leave racism at the door. I mean, some of these people have experienced a lot more than I have. Yes. And I, I empathise with them hmm. a lot. And therefore, it's not my role to heap more of that negative stuff on them. So I try and encourage them. I, I take on students from those other um, Muslim communities yes. and bring them in because they have to do a certain element to be able to have a cert three in community services. Hmm. Um, that gives you an opportunity to share Yes, which they I've wouldn't have invited, even been yeah, aware. I've been invited to their homes to sit down and have a meal, and yep. you know, building those relationships and and having having they have access to someone in community who can share things. And I was approached yesterday by the by someone who anybody I've got to do a cert three in community services, but I don't know anybody in the Aboriginal community. And if they're going into community services, they have to do a, a what do you call it, an element. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm based on Aboriginal culture. And they've got to reach out and find someone and connect. And they ring Logan City Council on my name. Yeah, you're on the top <laughs> of the list. You're on the hot list. Well, the list hasn't been changed in so many years. <laughs> and I haven't bothered to ring up and change it either. But, you know, it's a service that I, I offer. But even not, not just working with um, new migrants, you also work with, uh, who've also had a very uh, long relationship with people in this country, uh, which is the Chinese, you know, the Asian population. Tell, tell, tell us about what you're doing there, which I think is fantastic, but um, share that. Well, I have a son who um, is part Aboriginal, Chinese, Malay, and Torres Strait Islander. And when he was in high school, um, he had a passion for Kung Fu. So um, he took, he actually joined the club um, and he's been with the club for 20 years. So during that journey, he's travelled overseas to Vietnam, China, Hong Kong, Malaysia. And in 1990, 1999, he participated in the World Championships for Kung Fu. Oh, wow. And he won four gold medals. Only Aboriginal person to do it. But because he's so humble, this is what Kung Fu teaches mm. you, humility. Not many people know, but I do the bragging for him, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, to celebrate his 20 years with the, the thing, we want to do a dedication of a black lion. And we've purchased the black lion from China. We've called it Yulu Budabai, which means strong heart in our language. We want to be able to launch it and dedicate it to Lance for his services to that um, club. But also, we wanted to partner with the Chinese and the, the Kung Fu Club. So the Chinese Business Association has approached us to do a, a joint initiative which is 
uh, the serpent, the rainbow serpent and the dragon dance performing together for Chinese New Year next year in February. Oh, fabulous. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, it's, it's only just sort of, this has been on my books for about three or four years. Yes. And it, it's starting to grow legs now. So we've actually had our preliminary discussions with the Kung Fu Club. We've got the Chinese Business Association who want to support it. And now I'm, I've rung ACPA. ACPA are going to see if they can provide some of the Aboriginal dancers to mm. perform in February. So, but we haven't even got the costume yet. It's got to come <laughs> from China. And guess what? <laughs> That's oh, going to take three, year, to three oh. months or something to get the, to get the costume here. Gee. Um, and so why the black line? What does that represent? The colour, the Aboriginal people. Ah, is it specially made or is it? Yes, it's specially made. We uh, requested a specially made, this is two years ago we bought the lion, the, China, the you know, the black lion. Yes. We bought it two years ago with the intention of launching, of dedicating to Lance, but because COVID's been around for a while, mm. we just haven't had the opportunity. So um, if we get the opportunity in February next year, we'll do the dedication, but we'll also perform the... Um, Rainbow Serpent and Dragon Dance together. Choreography has not yet been, so mm. we've got a bit of time and a bit, yeah. plus a bit of pressure. Yes. To, but that's one initiative that we have. We, you know, it's it's about, like you say, building those relationships mm. and living in harmony in the community. Yes. Understanding yes. one another. And it's 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 amazing the people you meet who share your thoughts and ideas but they come from a different community. You know what I mean? They have the same, yes, we wanted to do something like this for a long time, Auntie Betty, but we didn't know how to go about it. Mm. And There's a lot of people who don't know how to interact with First Nations because a lot of them don't even understand simple things. Um, we were chatting earlier about um, even the protocols around uncle and auntie, you know, and eldership and mm. traditional owner, traditional custodian, you know, like these words that a lot of people get mixed up. What's your thoughts on, like, ha explain to the listeners how that works. Like, you're a traditional custodian in Mitchell or Gungari country, but here in Logan, yeah. you're an elder. Yeah. And yet, I'll call you Auntie Betty, but you're not my auntie, but there's a respect there when we start calling someone auntie yeah. or uncle. But then there are other people you've taught me that put that name on themselves and don't haven't done the work, haven't done the work. Yeah, well how that, to, explain how that all works. It's, it's, it's about earning that respect. Yes. And if you don't earn that respect, you cannot call yourself an elder, you know. So is that I, different? I can go and call myself queen if I want to, but yeah. have, have I put the work in, have I done all this, you know. It's about um, being true to that position or that title that you want to give yourself, no, so, or that's bestowed on you, basically. Yes, I was going to say, is it bestowed by the community generally? And is it harder in cities where a lot of people have come f you away know, from it? It should start within the family. Yes. It should start with your family or your mob. Yep. Because when you, and, and our mob know that when you reach a certain age, then you're automatically an auntie or an uncle, or, you know, I've seen young people, cause, because it's the position they hold in the family. Yes. Um, if they're the eldest of the family and they're only 40, then they, because they're the eldest in that mob, they can be called, they can have that title. But it's really up to them whether they want to wear it. So is there a our young, Our people are dying so young yes. that we have people age 40 who, who are leaders of a family mm. group and they have that right. But whether yes. they want to exercise that right is really up to them. Do some people just appoint it themselves? Some do, because they've reached a certain age. Yep. Um, how, do you, how do you feel about that? How do, is that confusing for some people? Does it that, is. Yeah. It is confusing. And, and I had a word with you before that there was somebody here that I, I wasn't willing to engage with because mm -hmm. I know that that person hasn't earned the respect that they've given themselves. So yep. it's, you know, it's about my integrity as well yes i value my integrity and and i don't want to be associating with people who have done the wrong thing by community mm. and and you know have basically um 
I don't know, insulted people and done the wrong thing. And it is quite complex too, isn't it? Because when you look back in some of the history, you've got in those early days of the, the term they called blackbirding, when they were um, basically kidnapping people and bringing them to Australia to do the cane cutting, I think, out of um, the South Sea Islanders, who some then probably married or you know, partnered with Aboriginal people, First Nations or Torres Strait Islanders. And then they'd go on sometimes, I would assume, and claim that they were Aboriginal. Is that type of thing? That, that's well, part look, of our past, isn't it? If they have the bloodline, I have no issue with them claiming their heritage. Yes. Um, but it's what they've done to, to support their community, their mm. people. What are they actively doing yes, in the community? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, you know, when, when you go for a job, You've got to show experience and knowledge, mm. demonstrate ex You can't just put yourself in that position. I have people ringing me all the time. Um, I found out I'm Aboriginal, only Betty, and um, I need to um, find out how I go about accessing free medical, free dental. Do I get a card or something? <laughs> said, um, what do you uh, say to them? How do you direct them? I said, nothing. I said, no, nothing like that. I said, <coughs> um, I'm, I'm not about denying anybody their heritage. Mm. I will prove or I will provide confirmation of Aboriginality purely because they have the bloodline. How the services react to that or you know acknowledge that or whatever, that's up to them. Mm. But it's my job to identify these people and to give them that acknowledgement that they do have a bloodline. If they want to take it any further than that, then that's up to them. And people, you know, the services will know if they're you know, genuine or not. So there is an organisation, isn't there, called Linked? What's Link that? Up. Link Up. Yeah, and that's a very, very uh, successful organisation to help people trace their ancestry, isn't it? Yes. Yep. Yes. There's been a lot of good stories come out of Link Up, um, and um, a lot of successful reunifications, you know, in family members and whatnot throughout throughout Australia. I have a cousin Debbie who was used to link up to find her mum mm. down at um, Echuca in Victoria. So you know we, we've had those successes ourselves using link up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is a lot of people that through that whole period of three to four generations of stolen yeah. uh, children, it, it takes a lot to get back to understand who you are and who your ancestors are. Yep. I would assume, you know, there's a lot of that healing being done, isn't there? Yeah, and because our old people are dying without sharing that knowledge, we're losing a lot. And what about language? Did you learn from your from your mum or dad language at all? That it's you know, growing up on the reserve there, I used to sleep with my grandmother and she used to sleep with me on one side and Peggy on the other side. And she used to call us her hot water bottles. <laughs> she would sing in language at night, but she would never teach us because if she was caught teaching us the language, we would be taken. So she dreaded the fact that she couldn't teach us because. So you know, did you did you learn um, about initiation then? Were they allowed to do that? So in your period, you weren't no. allowed to go through secret women's business. Nothing. No. no. The same allowed. with the boys to men, I suppose, at the same time. There just weren't the people around and anybody caught doing that was either, you know, removed, sent to another community. I mean, a lot of our mob ended up in Cherbourg um, because of mm. the roundup and whatnot. Do you think now, today, in 2021, and, and, and sort of, I've been hearing more and more that are starting to try to find and discover their culture, but some early comments you said about the young uh, ones in the detention, detention centre aren't willing to sort of embrace a very deep and connect to who and where they're from? Well, they have a fear of being treated differently if they're identified as Aboriginal. I don't know what they've heard, but you know, sometimes if they're fair-skinned they can get away with and they don't have to be treated as an mm. Aboriginal person, yep. and, and because they are treated differently. Um, I have one young fella who um, 
I used to work with in BYDC and um, I said to him, because he was fair skinned, I said, are you Aboriginal? He said, yeah. I said, well, where do you come from, mate? He said, I don't know because um, I was removed from my mother. But I'm back with my mother now. And I said, so do you know where you were born? Yes. Or, or do you know where your father was born? Or, um, yeah, New South Wales. So I had a look on the map and I said, well, this is who you are. You're from this mob here. You're a Wiradjuri person. The next two days, because it was summertime, the next two days he's sunning himself trying to get black. Oh. <laughs> he turned into a lobster, poor fella. <laughs> oh, no. But, the, you yes. know, the connection was so strong that he wanted yep. to be black. He, wanted, he knew he wasn't. He didn't did look he, like did he, he feel? Like did he always feel a different... Is there a sense of something that... That, that is inside someone to know that he they... He didn't know. He just didn't know. No. And, he, and he wasn't... Um, he wasn't interested. Yep. Yeah. But when he did come into the detention centre, he identified as an Aboriginal person because he knew his father was an Aboriginal person. While he was in there, I had contact with the father and the grandfather, and they both confirmed his Aboriginality. And so, you know... And some of these things around being Aboriginal, you know... Uh, things that you've talked to me over the years about totems and and all the sort of the dreaming and the uh, mm -hmm. does that sort of that's still part of your everyday life well it's still part of my practice because i'm taking some grandkids home in two weeks time to give them their dreaming and you know back to gungri country back to yeah. gungri country i'm going in two weeks to because i've got two grand two granddaughters and three grandsons that haven't been given a dreaming mm. Um, that will complete the whole batch then. Yes. Um, you know, my job is done in terms of my job as bestowing the dreaming on the, on the grandkids. It's normally in our um, uncle or aunties, but um, they've never been part of it. So, yeah, I, I actually do it as part of my responsibilities because it's about connecting these kids to the culture, knowing who they are, what their totem is, and their dreaming. Their dreaming is an individual trait whereas the totem belongs to the whole clan. And I identify as emu, and they all identify as emu, but they can also have the traits of a kangaroo, not a, oh well. I've got a wombat, I've got a koala, I've got a willy wagtail, I've got a major Mitchell cockatoo. So they're the girls, mm. I've got five girls, already given their dreaming. And it's increased their connection, it's increased their self-esteem mm. and their self-identification. They know who they are, they know where they come from. Does it give them identity, meaning, belonging, a Absolutely. sense of all of that, which is sort of yeah. like anchors them a bit, doesn't it? Because the three eldest ones, uh, no, out of the four eldest ones, three are fair skin and don't look Aboriginal. And people will challenge them because they'll they'll go to all the Aboriginal stuff and you're not Aboriginal, you don't even look Aboriginal. But I know who I am, I know where I come from, I know my totem, I know my dreaming. So, you know, that's something that not a lot of Aboriginal kids have and that's something that we need to take care of. We need to give them these things that belong to them. Mm. Um, I just did a smoking ceremony for a young girl who lost her husband in the river, died in, you know, drowned in the river. And I didn't know at the time that they were Aboriginal people. They just didn't have that connection, didn't have a way of connecting. So I only knew the grandmother through um, business in Logan. And then she told me that she's Aboriginal and she's got a granddaughter whose husband has just passed on. So, you know, she couldn't couldn't fathom. You know, she's only a young girl and she's got th three young kids. Mm. You know, how does she now move on without the partner? So it was... Um, Connecting mm. her to the culture and yes. sharing things with her. And, you know, mm. she said it was Father's Day coming up. And um, I said, well, what does she want to do? She said, she doesn't know. I said, well, where is she most comfortable? Where does she find herself? She said, she, she often goes down to the river where we pass. I said, well, tell her to go down there. Maintain that connection. Mm. You know, put a pebble in the water and announce your presence and sit and talk. And let them know how you feel and you know, what you intend to do and, you know, about the kids and everything, just have a conversation. She did that. She went back home and what she needed to do in the house, she did. And she said, her grandmother rang me yesterday and said she's the, in the best place she's ever been as a young Aboriginal girl. 
because she's connected to the culture where she never had that connection before. That's so how strong, powerful isn't it? it can it's be. so powerful. Mm. And I think, you know, what you've been really strong in educating even someone like myself, you know, over these years, and there's, there's three videos you got me to watch, and I think that was like a really good... Um, it gave me a deeper understanding. And I, I, look, it, it's not everything, but I, these, those three videos you told me to watch, one was Bringing Them Home, the report that the United Nations did in 1991 or 92. Uh, the second one was Swimming the River, which I've always tell people and suggest to, to see that. And the, the, the third one was the Healing Foundation, mm. you know, which sort of gives the whole sort of steps of what's occurred since colonisation and, yeah. and, and the trauma that's come along with that and Even how to heal it. they produced differently, mm. you can find different messages in the whole yes. three of them. Yeah, from all um, perspectives. Because, like, yeah, that's right. Gave me a deeper, deeper respect, a deeper understanding, a deeper knowing of what's gone on <clears throat> so that we can play some role mm. in building the bridges, you know, yeah. and building out. And, you know, so I know that if I had a conversation with a Aboriginal person on the street, and I can now ask them, you know, where's their mob and who they are. And you'll know straight away how connected they are. And these are some of the learnings, oh, isn't it? Yeah. And, and you know, the first thing I, I pick up from anybody is whether they address me as auntie. Yes. That's a display of respect already. Mm. And so you know that they do come from a culture or place of respect. So one of the... One of the beautiful things is I, I actually put those videos up on the website. Okay. Um, I've called them Healing the Past and they're on the Yarn Up section of our Walk in Three Worlds website. And I've acknowledged you for your wisdom to point me to that direction, which I, I really want to share with people because I think when everyone gets, that's just a glimpse of an insight. And someone like yourself having you today, I mean, there is so much insight and in this time of the podcast, um, we'll obviously love to have you back at mm -hmm. some point and talk deeper uh, about your past. Is there anything you want to leave it with as we're sort of closing? Um, this place here, Coral Dargan. Okay, so the place that we're operating in on the banks of the Brisbane or the Mianjin River um, is called Kural Dargan. That's the unit. This is Kurilpa. And this is Kurilpa, this is Kurilpa, or Garilpa, as some people call it, don't they? And do you know what totem? Yeah, so it's the water rat. Yes. Yeah, and see now to is, know that yeah. is because of the education I've had from yourself and Yarrick Home Bales and, yeah. you know, like all these people who remind us about the sacredness of these places, you know, mm. the Garilpa or Kurilpa, yeah. which is West End, you know, yeah. the Aboriginal name, Mianjin being Brisbane. Yep. And even to be able to say that stuff, and then you, f I feel, connected to the land that you're connected to. Mm. Yep. You know, we understand the stories and the truer histories of what yep. this place is about. Yeah. Um, and just in terms of our country, our land, you know, it doesn't, for me, it it doesn't mean to say that we have to be on land to practice our culture. We can do it anywhere. But it's that those sacred sites on country that we must remember and we must reconnect with every so often. So we go back to country to reconnect, to um, reinvigorate the, you know, the cultural, um, spiritual and, yeah, those beliefs and things, mm. the knowledge and beliefs, yeah. Um, because when, and this is, what I've learned over time, because when we, when we um, are not on country, we're engaging in a lot of stuff that weakens our spirit, let's say. And so therefore, when we feel like we're weakening our spirits, that's when we've got to go back home and connect. That's why I've taken time off work this week because I have just hit a brick wall. Mm. So now I know I've got to go back to country and I'm going back in two weeks' time, taking the family back home. So again, there's a, there's a secondary primary and secondary reason why I have to go back home. I have to reconnect spiritually, but I also have to undertake my um, cultural responsibilities in terms of giving those kids their dream. Beautiful. Beautiful. To re-energise you. 
Yeah, and it's yeah. also part of your healing, isn't it? Yes. Going yeah. back to country and taking your grandkids and, yep. you know, Don't taking them through the process. And when we go back home, the first thing we do, because we can't go on sacred um, ground unless we're smoked, yep. so what we do to reconnect, we go down the river and put our feet in the water. And it's so healing, it's so magical, you know, just to sit there with a few of us sitting there just yarning about, you know, what it's, what's, what it's like to be back home and mm. hope we see this one and hope so-and-so is coming out and, you know, catching up with different family members. But you can feel the change in yourself while you're just sitting there with your feet in the water. It's, it's a full magic. cycle for yeah. you from the, the start of telling the yes. story about the river and here Growing you are telling the river. Yep. So it's a beautiful end to this. How about a big hug? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. I really, really appreciate Thank it. You. And Thanks, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed meeting my dear friend, Auntie Betty McGrady, and hearing some of her stories. Yes. Um, don't forget to come and subscribe to our website, which is www.walkin3worlds.com. And also, if you want to become a patron for us, come to our site and learn about how you can be a Patreon supporter of our site. And thank you, everyone, and have a great week. Have a great... Does anybody feed in questions to you that I might... So if anyone does want to feed any questions, yeah, we've got two Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the most important one is Walking Three Worlds podcast. Mm -hmm. You can find us there. And if you've got any questions that you want to send to Auntie Betty, um, just drop them there and I'll nudge her and let her know that it's time to have a yarn with someone. So feel free to reach out and happy connect. Happy to share. Happy to She's share. very happy to share. Anyway, thank you everyone. And thanks for listening and viewing. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Nala Nangala. <laughs> means I'm going now. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs>